India's Chandrayaan mission. It's our biggest space adventure till date. What's it all about? Well, India is to begin its second journey to the moon on July 15th, Monday at 2.51 a.m., so Sunday night, Monday morning. Now, India's heaviest rocket, the geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle Mark III, or it's often called Bahubali, is being used. The rocket weighs a whopping 640 tons, or 1.5 times the weight of a fully loaded Boeing 747 jumbo jet. Now, the rocket stands as tall as a 15-story building at 44 meters. The mission cost is 1,000 crore rupees. It's one of the least expensive missions ever attempted uh, of this nature anywhere in the world. India is known for its frugal engineering. The President Ramnath Kovind will witness the launch at 2.51 a.m. on Monday morning. We'll be broadcasting that live here on NDTV. Chandrayaan-2 comprises of an orbiter, a lander called Vikram, and a moon rover called Pragyan. Now, if India reaches the surface of the moon with a soft landing, it will be the fourth country to achieve this. Now, who's leading this entire mission? Well, ISRO has chosen two women to lead the moon mission. M. Vanita is the project director, and Ritu Karidhal is the mission director. Now, India hopes to soft land on the lunar surface in the first week of September. Whatever that uh, rover we made, when it is uh, moving, that, uh, that the wheel will make an impression about the uh, ISRO logo as well as one side that our uh, Ashoka Chakra. We will be carrying this uh, Indian the tricolor also in both lander and uh, that, uh, rover. That's our, our plan. So like Neil Armstrong, we will need lead a permanent insignia on the lunar surface. Uh, yes, certainly. All right, so it's going to be an incredible mission. Just a reminder to our viewers, 2.50 a.m. Monday morning, that's Sunday night, Monday morning, that's when uh, we'll be broadcasting live the blast-off of the GSLV rocket. Uh, joining us now, our science editor, Pallav Bagda, and with him, uh, one of the foremost minds in the Indian space program, the former head of ISRO, Dr. Madhavan Nair. It's always, always a pleasure uh, to speak to you, Dr. Nair. Are you very excited about the prospects of this mission, or are you, like some of the scientists and others, in incredibly nervous? And you have to be honest. Uh, well, I think uh, this mission is the uh, most complex one which ISRO has undertaken so far. Uh, but at the same time, I must compliment ISRO for the excellent efforts what they have put in. Uh, last two years, uh, they have been uh, looking at every aspect of it uh, once over. And whatever uh, minutest problem uh, they have noticed has been corrected. And a large number of tests also has been done. So uh, we are, uh, of course, we are anxious, but not nervous at this occasion. Uh, Pallav, um, one of the key points that, uh, in fact, I'm going to refer to it right away. The project is being led by women. Muthaya Vanita has spent three decades at ISRO. Let's bring up those images. She's an electronics and communications engineer from Chennai. She spent years nurturing the mission. Uh, to now uh, when it's ready for a launch. She's the project director for Chandrayaan 2. And Ritu Karidhal, an aerospace engineer, has spent two decades at ISRO and played a key role in navigating Mangalyaan to Mars. That's the other big mission we've done. She's now mission director for Chandrayaan 2. Pallav, um, th this is a wonderful story, but uh, the fact of the matter is that ISRO has had some incredible women scientists and engineers at various levels. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the fact is that they are now emerging in some of the toughest programs uh, that, that we have. Oh, certainly. Uh, these are not the first women leaders at ISRO. ISRO has had satellite uh, engineers, women engineers who have led satellite missions in the past as well. Uh, there was Anuradha and there was, a, there was a deputy director at the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. So ISRO has a tradition of women who lead from the front. Uh, and I must tell you, Vishnu, when I go on to the shop floor at ISRO, ISRO in the clean room, 
I find men and women working shoulder to shoulder and there is no difference or any kind of gender bias. Repeatedly women of all ages have told me at ISRO they have faced no gender bias and only talent is the consideration. You are talented, you will get selected to lead. If you are not talented, then you won't. Man or woman, it doesn't matter. It's the talent which matters. Dr. Nair, would you like to come in on this point? Because the, 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 the only reason I ask this question is because there are certain stereotypes in our country where a lot of women don't want to get into engineering. Uh, they don't necessarily want to get into a lot of aviation, for example. Uh, these are some old biases and stereotypes which have existed. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule, as we've seen in this case. Uh, but in ISRO, what is the culture that encourages men and women to be working effectively based entirely on talent and contribution? Well, ISRO has been encouraging the women engineers and scientists right from beginning. Uh, well, in one sense, uh, uh, we had uh, about 20% of the uh, uh, the posts filled by the women scientists yep. and they have contributed excellently well whether it is in the launch vehicles, the communication areas, satellites or applications and so on. They are uh, as efficient as the men in the organization and they work uh, uh, hand in hand with them and also their efficiency is uh, quite uh, uh, I mean, I will say that it is uh, slightly better than the men in the sense, you know, they want to reach home as early as possible. So they don't stretch the work. They will finish off everything in the uh, working time itself. So uh, the, their efforts have really paid dividends and we are extremely happy. There are deputy directors, there are general managers, uh, there is a space physics laboratory being headed by a woman and uh, so on. So that way, I think uh, we are proud that we have given equal opportunity to uh, women in ISRO and uh, they have come up in their career, uh, not as much as the men, but at least uh, they are not lagging behind very much. So the other big point that, uh, in fact, Pallav, we can talk about is the cost of the Chandrayaan mission. Chandrayaan 2 costs India about $150 million. It's been 11 years in the making. It's one of the cheapest missions to attempt landing on the moon. It's the usual missions from NASA cost four to four, five times more. Now, the, the, the making of the spacecraft cost about 600 crores, uh, the rocket 375 crores. Most of this is money spent on the Indian industry as, as is what uh, ISRO asserts. The cheapest mission to the moon, however, is uh, the, or was the Israeli Bereshit spacecraft that weighed 585 kilos, cost just about 100 million. So this isn't uh, the cheapest, but that mission, I'm told, uh, was not uh, as, uh, as successful. Uh, Pallav, give us an idea uh, about the costs and frugal engineering of, uh, of ISRO. Well, there is no doubt that ISRO does work with very frugal engineering and they're able to keep the cost down. But we should also remember that ISRO is a government organization. They are not a private organization. They don't have to pay a dividend out to our shareholders, unlike Boeing or Lockheed Martin, which make uh, uh, satellites in America. And at the same time, uh, it has been 11 years in the making. How much cost has gone in for the salaries of the people? What has been actually used or accounted for in this 1,000 crores is not clear. And next. India doesn't pay any cost for insurance for the rocket. If the rocket fails, you and I and the entire Indian community bears the cost. So the insurance cost is not there. So, so when we look at costs and call frugal engineering by India, we should be a little careful and we should really look at the real costs. And I don't think the real costs are really available uh, because the budgeting process in the current form of the governance as we see today is highly non-transparent. Okay. Um, and uh, Dr. Nair, uh, you know, I'm, there's so much excitement well, about think, uh, the launch itself. I obviously, like to, yeah, I have uh, a comment on that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. Uh, well, I think, uh, yes, it's a fact that uh, we are not insuring because the government property and uh, insurance money will come from the public funds only, uh, mostly the public funds. Uh, but at the same time, the, when we cost a mission, 
uh, whatever is the efforts which it put is banned by the ISRO is built into it. And uh, also we factor into uh, the cost effectiveness come for many reasons. Uh, 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 actually the the human, uh, the salaries what we pay to our engineers and scientists mm -hmm. are only about one-fifth of what uh, developed countries pay. Then the second thing is uh, our paying dividends uh, to the government. It is returned as a social service uh, okay. in many areas, whether right. it is in earth observation or communication. Uh, some time back we made a study. We have given back to the country nearly one and a half times the investment what they have made in the uh, uh, the what uh, the government has uh, invested in the ISRO programs. So that way, I think we are not uh, though we are not accounting in terms of the profit, but we are not uh, running a loss of business. Uh, as far as the cost of it comes because of the efficiency, clear thinking, clear planning, and uh, also building upon the pedigree. If you look at the launch vehicle or the satellites. We use the technologies we will tap for the earlier satellites to the maximum extent so the development costs are minimum and we don't have to pay the contractors overheads and so on. So that way certainly we are cost effective. I will say that uh, it is not uh, uh, one fifth of the US but we are about 50 to 60 percent compared to what the others do. Sure. Lots of absolutely key points uh, over there and we'll keep discussing this over the next couple of days and as I mentioned we'll be broadcasting that launch absolutely live. I'll be here in the NDTV studio. Pallav, lucky enough to be in Sri Harikota. We've <laughs> yes. done this uh, kind of reporting so often but it, the role never gets reversed. I end up being over here. He has all the fun in Sri Harikota. Uh, perhaps we need to change you, that. I'm sure you, Dr. Nair you are a gifted would, would back anchor, me on Vishnu. that. You are a gifted anchor. <laughs> I, I am a foot soldier. I go on to Sri Harikota and face the dust and heat. You sit in the air-conditioned environment. No, you no, are Pallav, the gifted anchor. <laughs> this in Sri Harikota, you also sit in an air-conditioned building because the launch facility is entirely air-conditioned. No, 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 no. And I assume that the air-conditioning there is better than the air-conditioning in our studio. Well, <laughs> well, well, come once. Vishnu, come once. All we right, we'll do you. that. We'll do that. We'll do that. But I look forward to this, uh, to more conversation <laughs> and yeah. a lot more on the serious science uh, of Chandrayaan 2. Later on, we'll be doing that and hopefully Dr. Nair can join us later on as well.